Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie OK, you're very welcome along to this week's episode of Friday Night Racing here on Off The Ball Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie and uh, we're going to talk about the Kerry National, we're going to talk about the Stole, we're going to specifically talk about handicapping this week and I'm delighted to say that our guest this week is Andrew Sandy Shaw. Sandy, good afternoon to you, how are you? Hello, Ger, very well, thanks. Um, we're, we've been uh, nerding out in, in recent weeks about um, different aspects of the sport. Anytime we get the opportunity to talk to you, it's like brilliant because I really feel like everybody gets an understanding of how the game actually works. Before, right. I, get, before I get the explainer this week, right, uh, yeah. How do you become a handicapper? Like, because I presume as a kid you're not dreaming of becoming a handicapper. No, I wasn't dreaming of becoming a handicapper at all. I certainly always wanted to be involved with horses. Um, my dad had been a jockey uh, trainer. Uh, my mother was involved in the business as well. And all we ever wanted was to get involved in horses. And uh, that's how it came about. Um, I spent a year in agricultural college uh, prior to going to the Irish National Stud to do the stud management course there. And after that, I flew off to Kentucky with a number of my colleagues and I worked as a stallion man over there, which meant looking after four stallions at Spendthrift Farm in Kentucky. How do you, and, get, how, how do you get the gig in Kentucky? Because it, it's like, I mean, I know it's not a world away given that you've trained in uh, agriculture college and then gone to the National Stud, so it might be a fairly natural progression. But for a kid from Kildare, it's not obvious that you're going to end up in Kentucky. No, it was uh, it was mainly due to Michael Osborne, who was uh, he was a great man. He initiated the National Stud course. It's it's world renowned. It's a world renowned course, and uh, he always was. He seemed to be in a position where he was able to get his students across to the likes of Kentucky and other places in the world. He had all the contacts, and he put. You know, we all wanted to go somewhere like Kentucky, and he put me forward. And they took me on. There was two or three of us went over at the same time. And he took me on. And uh, they asked me to look after four stallions. How and, long, uh, how long were you there? I was there for about a year. Right. I was there for about a year. Spent a full season there. Uh, was there for about a year. And then came back home. I was always a bit of a home bird. Uh, I certainly enjoyed my time over in Kentucky. But uh, I was always happy to come home. And uh, when I got home then, I ended up getting a job in uh, Brownstown Stud on the Curra, uh, managing Brownstown Stud, uh, and which was close to home. I live in Newbridge and it was very close to home. And um, I was there for 12 years. So you're pretty, 12 years. pretty young when you get that gig? Yeah, pretty young. I would have been uh, in my early 20s. Right. Early 20s, yeah. Yeah, I would have been in my early 20s. You must have been very responsible in your early 20s for you getting a gig that big to, to be managing and to be responsible for stuff. Well, funny enough, how it happened actually, Ger, was that my mother was the secretary there. And over the years, she worked for the McGrath family. And uh, she was there for oh, 25 years herself. And uh, every summer or any time I had holidays, I used to go over there and I'd give her a hand with all the various things, uh, accounts, registrations, everything, and got to know how to run the office, basically. Right. And then, unfortunately, at the time, like shortly after I came back from Kentucky, uh, she became ill and uh, she wasn't able to work anymore, or certainly not at the time, she wasn't a able to a able to come back for a few months. And I was asked by the McGraths, would I, would I take her place? Right. Because I knew the ins and outs and everything that was there. And then it was uh, taken over by uh, one of the family within the McGraths, uh, Paddy McGrath. And I was asked, would I stay on and eventually manage the, uh, the stud farm side of it because his son, Neil, was taking over the training of horses there. They were bringing a lot of horses into training there at uh, Brownstown. And he was training uh, the horses, the race horses, and I was managing the stud farm. Right. Okay. So, and at that stage, obviously, you've kind of you've done the training and you've got the gig, and you're thinking, you can see how all of that retrospectively begins to make sense in terms of a, a career path as well. And I guess you must have felt pretty happy about how things were going at that point. Oh, I was I was delighted the way it was all going. It, it all fell in my lap to a certain extent. And uh, but then the the McGrath family decided to wind down. And they decided to wind down and I knew it was coming to an end. And around that time, uh, I said, I better have a look and see what else I can do with my life. And uh, an advertisement happened to appear in the Irish field for a handicapper. Right. And uh, 
didn't know much about it now, to be honest, at the time. Uh, I knew what it was and roughly how it was done, but I'd, I put it this way. I didn't envisage for the year, all the years before that I would, that I would ever end up being a handicapper. But uh, I applied for the job, got the job. Uh, Noel O'Brien, the late Noel O'Brien, was the senior handicapper at the time. And I worked with Noel for more than 20 years. Uh, we were good friends. Uh, our families became good friends. Uh, and then, unfortunately, poor Noel uh, developed a, a tumorous cancer, uh, or a, a, a cancerous tumor, I should say, and uh, in early January 2017. And um, unfortunately, it didn't work out too well, you know, and sadly, he died in December of 2017. So uh, suddenly, I was thrown into the limelight, so to speak, and uh, I took over from there. And that's how it all happened really he, he came into my head the other day actually Sandy I don't know for what reason it was um, and it's strange sometimes when, when you um, you just get this thing that jolts into your mind about Jesus Noel how, 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 how you know that, that he passed away and how long he was gone and um, it's kind of some days it's kind of hard to believe it because he was just such a fixture he was always racing um, and you know the handicapper isn't obliged to go racing I've, I've had this um debate with handicappers down the years but Noel, Noel wanted to be like whereas I suppose the politician um, thinks it's great to go to the funerals and be seen to be to be, to be be around the people. Noel actually thought it really was useful to, like a referee almost explain his decision to an array trainer at the race course and I think they really respect him for that. Oh yeah, Noel was hugely popular and it, it, uh, he taught me that as well because uh, I all the time communicate with trainers or answer any call or any question that they have and he was always good for that you know uh, he loved the social scene um, no he, he was ev everybody seemed to love Noel and Noel seemed to know everybody we used to say when Noel would go away for an overnight to Galway he always knew somewhere he could stay there was all there was a people he there was people he knew in every county and uh, yeah he was he was very very popular and a, a extremely hard act to fill uh, and uh, look I filled it but not probably in the same way as Noel I wouldn't have been as much into the social side of things uh, as as Noel probably was but uh, I'm just inclined to get on with the job I'm just inclined to get on with the job I I'd be I'd be quieter in that respect I would have said you know Did you ever talk to him about his predecessor and whether or not they were as accessible to trainers and to people generally to explain stuff was that something that he'd done himself I suppose is what I'm wondering I would say, Ger, like back in that time, trainers and handicappers didn't really talk. Uh, now, you, you do have to go back to an era you're talking about there when uh, an awful lot of people had even got phones, you know. So, so um, uh, and as well as that, handicappers had to go to the races to see the races because right, of course. there was no there was no nothing on TV or anything like that you know there was no SIS I, I remember it was a it was a huge jump when all you would get in a betting office was audio and then suddenly we had pictures and it was a huge thing like you know you had pictures in the bookie office and then as time went on uh, you could get them on your on your home TV and it, it uh, developed there like where, where I am now Yes, we use the TV, but we also now have access to all the cameras that the general public wouldn't see, right. like side-on shots, head-on shots, scout uh, angles, everything like, you know. So we are more or less able to do our job from home. Um, but look, having said that, you like to go to the races, you like to uh, meet the people trainers might have a few questions to ask you most of them will will ring you like you know most of them will ring we're always happy to oblige and um uh, other than that we'd meet them at the races and discuss their horses i'm going to get into so. the, the use of the technology in a moment but can you take us back to your first day when you've come from the bloodstock industry and managing studs and you know all that stuff to going into work and it's like right let's let's handicap a race here what what, yeah. what are you doing How, like there's no school for that yeah yeah i hadn't a clue I hadn't a clue when I started. Like you, you didn't know, tell like, him that in the job interview. <laughs> yeah, 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 I haven't no. a clue. <laughs> well, funny enough, actually, uh, I didn't mention. I actually spent spent a month in uh, Time Form, who are um, a well known organisation which are involved in the handicapping end of things as well. And I went there for a month in 1977. It was just for experience. Um, I knew someone that knew someone that got me in there for a month during the during the summer holidays. So I did have some idea how it worked. And like just in general, watching racing and, and, and I was a punter myself type of thing, you know, you would study it fairly closely. But when it's there's so much more to it than I actually thought uh, when I when I actually got, got in there. And for the first the first year, uh, 
was difficult uh, trying to work out how it was done, the processes and so forth. And then after about three or four years, you think to yourself, I have it now, I have it now. And then maybe five years later, you would look back and you'd say, God, when I think of it, I hadn't really got a clue what I was doing, you know. And uh, But it just, it's, it's a job where uh, you can't teach someone you can't teach someone really how to do it. It's experience that is, is what counts, is what I would say to anybody. You spend years doing it. And it's like a golfer, I'd say, who goes out and he's a, he's a 20 handicapper. But if he's, if, he, if he's working at it every day, every year, um, he becomes better and he gets himself down to a, a tree handicapper or whatever, like, you know, and I think handicapping is a little bit the same. It's, it's time, over time, you begin to develop your own way of doing things. You're beginning to understand trainers, how they work. Certain trainers would have horses that take longer to mature. There's other trainers would have horses that are ready to go first time. You just get to understand the whole way. It's one huge big wheel, really. And uh, um, it took me a while to get get onto it really uh, as it turned out but you know I'm quite comfortable in it now it's 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 fairly straightforward to me and when Noel retired uh, or sorry when Noel died I should say um, I had to get someone to come with me uh, Shea Quinn is his name and, and Shea works with me closely uh, very good at the job as well but he'll admit himself it's it's he's still learning he's still learning it all takes time but uh, no we do the best we can we do the best we can uh, you mentioned earlier about referees um, that's what we are. That's really what we are. We are referees. We make decisions. Uh, not everybody agrees with those decisions. But uh, principally what I say, we don't always get it right. We just try to get it right more often than we get it wrong. I think you know? you're and, probably, yeah, you're probably slightly more popular than League of Ireland referees at the moment. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's interesting because you said the golf handicap. And like that, I'm always conscious of people on the show, listening on the show who are not necessarily into racing and may kind of be curious as to you know it's it's a lot of the stuff is quite archaic and handicapping um, I'm sure a lot of people who are sports fans don't understand racing I've heard about handicaps a million times but still really have no yeah. idea and I was obviously going to use the golf analogy it's interesting you use, you've used the golf handicap analogy actually for your own job but I suppose yeah a brief synopsis, Sandy, like it's to, to people listening in, a lot, you know, whatever um, percentage, but a very large chunk of races are handicaps and certain yeah. horses carry more weight on their back than others to essentially level the playing field. But I guess the challenge for you is the fact that racing is very unusual in that um, if in most sports you aspire to be the best but in handicapping you initially aspire to almost be the worst because it gives you the best chance of winning if you can explain that yeah i know what you mean like i mean it's it's uh yeah most of the horses in in our country despite all the successes you read about cheltenham and so forth and etc but the majority of horses in this country wouldn't be good enough to go to cheltenham and in most cases their only chance of ever winning a race would be via handi via the handicap route and uh it's Yes, you have to watch races very closely. As I say, it's it's a lot easier now with all the various angles and so forth. But uh, it seems to work okay. Yes, it's true. As I say at our trainers course, when I have to give the talk for uh, for the prospective new trainers, um, you know, it is your job to try and get the best handicap mark that you can. You know, that that's that's their 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 job. The lower of mark they can get, obviously, the better it is. But as I said, uh, you know, don't stick the two fingers up at us while you're while you're doing it. Mm. You know that 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 uh, you play fair, we'll play fair. Uh, because I often say, Johnny, that that um, you know, if if uh, if a trainer pulls the wool over your eyes, uh, pulls the wool over your eyes, and makes a bit of a fool of you, um, you're not be, you're not as inclined to be as, as as helpful next time around. You know that that uh, if there's an extra couple of pounds going the opposite direction that's what they'll get, you know, but I just find most trainers now, they're, they're, they're pretty easy to work with. Um, we get on quite well and I can't say I have, I have any real problems, but it is, it is a tricky sport that way that, you know, it is in the interest of trainers to get the lowest possible handicap uh, mark they can, which is fine once it's done within the rules. So how does it's it, done within the rules. How does it work? So when you're talking about the horses that aren't good enough to end up at Cheltenham, how do you categorise anything that is going to be a handicapper? Where do they start and where do they finish? Yeah, where they start, Jerry, is that to qualify, they have to qualify for a handicap mark. Um, uh, and to do that, they have to run at least three times. Now, I'll just take hurdles for, for, for the moment. They have to run at least three times. Um, and uh, 
the only exception to that is if they happen to win their first start. If a horse wins, he's immediately qualified for a handicap mark. Or if he wins one of his first two starts, he's qualified for a handicap mark. Otherwise, the majority of the horses will have to run three times. So we look at the three races and we generally take out the highest figure or the best figure as such that the horse has run to in those three races. Now, we do that by obviously comparing um, those runs to uh, on farm lines with other horses that are in the race or because those horses will possibly, a number of them will have ran, run in other races. Um, and we find a line where it, it leads us to maybe a handicapper who has a mark and we use him and work it back. Uh, and, uh, you know, it depends on the race, but if you can get a good line of form, we might have another horse in the race who has a strong line of form that we've already given a mark to. And if we're happy with that mark, then we'll work off that figure to get the mark for this particular horse. And we always hope, as I say, we're never always bang on, but we always hope that we can get that horse's mark within two or three pounds of where it should be. Because that would mean that very quickly, if we're not right this time, the next time it runs, if it needs to come down a pound or two, we'll, we'll do that. That horse will usually find its level and then off they go, the, off they go. And then, you know, that horse then in turn will be a help when the next one comes in that may have come from that race as well. But, you know, it can happen that uh, the horse that you give the mark to from a particular race mightn't turn out to be as good as you thought, might turn out to be better than you thought. So then you have to rejig all your figures. Right. Go back and look where you got that line of form, and see how it has affected these other horses. And can you do that? With that if, so if, 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 if I have a horse that uh, goes well in its third race, and mm. it, it goes up against another horse that uh, has yet to perform to its best, but that has a mark. And then later in the summer, that horse performs really well. Can you reassess my mark without me running again? Or do you have to wait for me to run again and then go, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, we, we can reassess it. It often happens that, you know, horse A beats horse B and horse A goes on and wins again. And then you go back and you look at horse B and you'll decide, do we need to do anything with this horse? But... We will look at the other horses from the race as well to see where they've all gone. And it might work out that the horse who went on and won again is the improver. He has gone on and improved, but the other horses in the race are telling us that the second horse hasn't improved. You know, that, that it's just that horse that has improved. Now, sometimes you can't be sure, but you have to make that decision. I don't like penalising horses who you've already given a mark to until they show us yeah. whether whether they... Uh, it would, it can, would seem can, unfair, can, yeah. yeah. I can it, see it, it, would, it would be unfair. It would be unfair. Yes, in hindsight, sometimes they can go, go on and win and you might say, I probably should have put an extra pound or two into them. But I generally like that horse to tell us rather than using the other horse. When it's only one horse yeah, that indicates the form has, has, has gone forward, um, you, you go back and you look at the other horse. Well, what about the third, the fourth and the fifth horse? Where did they go? And so, well, they went on, but they didn't really perform particularly well. So you hold back and you leave that second horse alone and let him tell you whether he's improved or not. Well, that seems fair enough. And how yeah. how how big is this coterie that we're talking about? How many horses and how wide does the handicap actually go? Yeah, the... the at the moment, there's there's about 3,000 horses on the system right. uh, at, with handicap marks at the moment. And about, I'd Can say you about... name them? <laughs> <laughs> I probably know they had a handicap mark if I saw the name, but I wouldn't be able to name them, I don't think, no. But, uh, What's the highest, actually? Uh, the highest handicapped horse over hurdles is Honeysuckle, which isn't too surprising. And Honeysuckle has a, has a figure of uh, 165. And then our minimum rating is 80. That is the lowest. That is the lowest. And so how long is see, that there, Sandy? Because remember in the days when, um, do you know, like you could be beaten 600 million lengths in three maiden <laughs> hurdles and you get a mark of whatever. And then, like, I, I vaguely remember in eight to ten years ago, it was like, no, you have to run to a base level here. You're not in the system. Yeah, yeah. Things changed there, Johnny, when, um, the, when, when we had the boom. And, 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 and there was so many horses in the system. There wasn't enough races. They couldn't be catered for. There was that many. And so we just decided to set a kind of a minimum level, a bit like, like I mean, you and me might decide, so we'll go and run in the 1500 metres at the next Olympics. But we can't unless we, unless we run to a, a particular level you know there's there's as you know there's always a kind of a time you have to uh, run within to qualify for the likes of the olympics it's a little bit similar to that uh, and it was it was really to to kind of 
cut back on the amount of horses because we just couldn't keep up with the volume of horses and have have races for them. So it was des- it was decided to, to go with a minimum of 80. If people want to continue to run off 80, they will. But, you know, the idea is that they would maybe go on to point to points or something like that or, 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 or go somewhere else. Uh, but we had to make room because all the time there's young horses coming through and we needed to make room. And it's not like, you know, promotion and relegation as such. It, it'd be as though every team that came into the Premier League stayed in the Premier League and was never relegated, you know, and you, you didn't have a relegation system. Mm. So on this to a certain extent, extent, it was a kind of a relegation system. But horses are not banned from running. They can continue to run off the minimum mark if they so wish. And usually it's a case that I'm sure owners or trainers would get fed up. Like, I mean, they might say that we're, it's wasting money here. We'll just take them out of training, maybe go point to pointing. But um, yeah, it's it's really to, as I say, we have almost 3,000 horses on the on the whole system and they, and they take a lot of catering for, you know. So that's why it doesn't happen over fences. Over fences is different. We only have about seven or 800 horses with handicap marks over fences hurdles is principally where most of the horses are and like as i say the minimum is 80 the maximum is 165 but you'd never see the likes of honeysuckle on 165 taking on a horse rated 80 so we they're, they're split up into brackets there's what we call 80 to 95 80 to 102 80 to 109 80 to 116 it goes up generally in jumps of seven so you will slot your horse generally into where it fits to their level and then in those races, you'll the, the handicap mark will dictate how much weight each of the horses carry. Yeah, that's it, uh, Ger. Like, I mean, you the, the principle uh, of the whole thing is, we'll say a horse is, has a rating of 130. He will carry a pound more than a horse rated 129. When turn will carry a pound more than a horse rated 128 and so forth. And that's that's how we that's how we set out the handicap. We could get a handicap where it's what we call 80 to 102. So... Uh, any horse that's rated anywhere between 80 and 102 can enter that race. A horse rated 103, 104, 105 obviously can't, but they can go into an 80 to 109 and then, you know, and further on a 116 and a 123 and so forth. So we take all the figures then. So 80 to 102, highest is 102. So the 102 horse carries the top weight and the top weight is at the moment it's 12 stone it's it was it's normally 11 12 but because of the pandemic they were they were allowing an extra couple of pounds for the jockeys uh so at the moment the top weight is 12 stone and the bottom weight is nine stone 12 so there's a 30 pound range Okay. So the 102 horse would carry the 12 stone, the 100 horse uh, would carry 11, 12 and so forth. So once we have the marks, they all slot into the handicap and it forms itself really like, you know, and uh, it goes right down as far as 80. Uh, but that's that's how it works. 12 stone, 11, 13, 11, 12 is 102, 101, 0 or uh, 102, 101 and 100 and so forth. And And, and, and that's how you set the handicap. And then there's say the one on nines you can go up to open handicaps where you would have you know it's there's there's no band at all it's not a one or two or a one on nine it's just an open handicap now they would generally be the big handicaps like the irish grand national or the galway plate the galway hurdle the Kerry national where the highest rated horse in the country can enter that once he's prepared to give away the weight if he's happy to give the weight away that's what he will do but we find that generally the horse is rated 150 and above um they're gen, gen, uh, generally el, uh, eligible for other races, conditioned races, as we call them, where they could run in races where they carry the same weight or maybe have to concede three or four pounds here and there, like, but they don't have to give away 30 pounds to horses. Okay, well, they, so, that's interesting because I think the weights just have been published in the last, I don't know, if it's 24 hours or whatever for the um, Guinness Kerry National Handicap yeah. in Listole, which I think yeah, is next yeah. Wednesday. Is that right? That's right. That's right, Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. So... Top weight is Brahma Bull on a mark of 154 for Willie Mullins. And then it's Chatham Street at 151, Animix 150, Durasso 150, Far Class 148. Now, look, the declarations aren't in, so we don't know if these horses are, are going to actually run. But So Brahma Bull on a top weight of 154. Is it possible that there will be a horse carrying three stone less in this race if Brahma Bull comes in? Is that correct? Uh it, it could be to a certain extent. but Theoretically, yeah. At the same time, it can't, theoretically. Okay. But first of all, you have to look at, there's there's a, um, a limit in the number of runners. Like everything that enters can't run. So there's, there's a limit of 18 horses allowed to run and there's 30-odd horses in the race. So the top 18 horses 
uh, will at the declaration that you mentioned there, the top 18 horses will get into the race. So in theory, if you're looking down there now, and what I'm looking at is that the number 18 uh, at the moment is a horse called Born by the Sea at 138. Okay. And he has now what I have is that yeah the, the the entries and the weights were done kind of ten days ago, and we're at a stage the next forfeit stage uh, as we'd call it where people can decide when you know people get to see the entries right they have a look and they might say I'm not. I'm not going to run. That race is too strong for me or whatever. So a certain amount of horses came out. Now, four or five horses have come out of the race since. And I have horse number 18 is born by the sea. So as things stand this minute, if everything was declared, he'd be the 18th and last horse to get into the race. Now, he's rated 138, right? So he has the equivalent of 10 stone eight. So the most Brahma bull will have to give to him is 16 pounds. Right. Give him 16 pounds. Now, if it so happened that there was kind of 25 allowed into the race. It depends on the track, you know, it depends on the track. You could have Leopard Sound could have 25 or 30. Navin could be the same. Uh, so it, it, it depends on how many horses the track can let into the race. And uh, in this instance, as I say, it's only 18, so the minimum is going to look like 10-8. But as I say, if, 20, if they were able to take 25, the minimum would be 10-4. Um, so it'll take as many horses as they can. So Brahma Bull, you know, it depends on what the bottom weighted horse is of the last uh, the, the last horse to get in as to how much weight he has to concede all round. Okay, but that you'll makes see, sense. But you'll, yeah, you'll see from the top four or five, there's only a few pounds between them, you know. Um, That's what's those, changed uh, as well in, in recent years, Sandy, that it's become those kind of top races have become so compressed. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very rarely, actually, when one of these top handicaps that... Uh, you will get anything what we say is out of the handicap mm. and out of the handicap just for 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 Gerald and anybody listening there means where i was saying the minimum weight is 912 but when you go down what we call the long handicap there could be horses on 910 97 nine stone now if the nine stone horse did happen to get in he would have to run at what we call uh, 12 pounds out of the handicap so in other words what we are saying he should be uh, he should be carrying nine stone, but because uh, the minimum weight to be carried is nine twelve, he has to run. He has to carry nine twelve, so he's twelve pounds wrong, as we would call. Didn't it. stop you know, Bobby Joe. Didn't stop Bobby Joe back in the day. Yeah, a different era, all right. But uh, you're right to say, like generally, we never have anything out of the handicap in these uh, big big races. Now they're very competitive, and the quality of horse we have in this country nowadays. And um, just a, a, a properly stupid follow-up question. So say I have a nine stone horse that does get in and I'm, I'm out of the handicap. Do you do you make me carry that extra stone or do yeah. I get away with it? Yeah, no, you have to carry it. Right. You have to carry it. You okay. have to carry that, that, that nine stone 12. At which point, carry that if 12. I still win, everybody's looking at me going, it shouldn't, it shouldn't happen. There. It How shouldn't happen. Yeah, it shouldn't. Yeah. 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 And especially if you've a gambled on winner who's out of the handicap, it's like, well, you know, on, that's you're, you're slightly pulling the wool over my eyes here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it'll be it'll be strange. You don't often. It can happen. It, it can happen. You mentioned Bobby Joe, but I think that was kind of a different era when. Uh, uh, and I know other horses that that have you know won from out of the handicap. It doesn't happen as often as it used to. That's all I would there say. Is, you know, there, there is a beauty to to it as well in that. And I I imagine and I'll put this to you that there's probably if if not a respect a grudging respect for the trainers who. Don't cheat, but you can you can handicap your horses in the sense of like I'm thinking of doing Dura. Um, and I still vividly remember him winning his first race over hurdles. I'm guessing he was rated about 85. Martin Mooney rode him, and he came yeah. through the field in Navin, um, like the the proverbial knife through butter. But I, I'm pretty sure that was over two miles, or, or or maybe two and a half. But he was running over. Um, he he'd been handicapped over effectively a, sh- a trip that was too short. He ended up then um, bolting up, got in his reserve, I think, in the Thiestes. Paul Carberry won on yeah. him, and then he went on and obviously won in Cheltenham, came out of the clouds. But like even. Fab- Avery Logique at the moment for a for a more topical example. Like it's 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 I, I do really admire trainers who play by the rules but can can sort of work the system where they have a progressive horse and they can get him handicapped and then he can progress and, and hit a kind of a I suppose a golden spell like Favre Logique. Yeah, yeah. Favre Logique, yeah, is a very interesting one really, because he had already run in handicap hurdles and chases, you know, last year and all that and didn't perform at all. But whatever Ross O'Sullivan did, he, he obviously found found the key to him and perfectly lit, 
legit like you know there was there was there was nothing to it it wasn't as though he was he was being kept back in any of his races or anything like, like that to wait for this to happen and most trainers can't afford to do that nowadays you know it's it's a uh, it was it was a case of the horse whatever happened you'll sometimes find wind operation the application of blinkers or tongue ties or or ground or trip you'd often hear trainers say we were running him over the wrong trip but didn't realize it uh, and you know certain trainers that they'll, they'll, they'll just find the keys to these horses uh, for various reasons and it's, it's perfectly normal like you know horses are entitled to improve um, but uh, yeah that's a pretty good example of it can it, I it, some... can I ask you sorry just, just sorry to interrupt but the, just in terms of you, you kind of inferred it there um, I, I spoke to Noel Moran during the week I did a piece in the currency with Noel Moran that um, was on about his investment in jumps races and, and um, yeah He's almost slightly anachronistic now in that he's saying, I wouldn't really have any interest. I, I'd follow the flat, but I wouldn't have that much interest. So, you know, he says in, in over hurdles and fences, there are, there are obstacles to jump. But he's, um, Noel obviously made a lot of money. Now, he's putting money into Bective, um the local GA club. He's putting money, money into Gaelic games. Primarily, he's investing in horses. And he bought Apple's Jade for 530 grand, I think, in fall yeah. to walk in the park. But that process... If you're breeding a national hunt horse, and this is everything going right, you're talking five or six years um, to get yeah. the horse to the track at all. So, and, and I spoke to John McConnell as well last night about how popular Dundalk has been and how, like, mm. you know, these the, the, a lot of owners now are more inclined to get into um, the flat game. Have you seen any change in the regard of, like, we're traditionally a national hunt country. Have you seen a change? You're talking about, like, the, the, the days of the Celtic Tiger and there were too many horses. Have you seen a change? And I know you're not handicapping on the flat, but where there has been a, a small bit of a, a sea change in terms of owners being more pragmatic and saying... Even if I breed this horse, he, he or she will race in two years. Whereas with National Hunt, notwithstanding that you've so many injuries as well, it's a long, mm. long process and it's costly. Yeah, yeah. I've I've seen that, certainly. It's it's become, um, when owners buy horses, they generally want results a lot quicker. In Back in the old days, if you remember the, the Derby sale where there were three-year-old geldings were being sold and they were bought and they mightn't hit the track until they were six and all that. That doesn't happen anymore. It's they, they, they want immediate results, really. You know, they generally want immediate results. So I think that's one of the reasons they might be inclined to look towards the flat because horses, you buy a yearling, it's ready to run as a two-year-old. They run over five furlongs. They can run more often. And uh, it's all about speed. And as you, as you probably see there, the, the likes of the staying races on the flat are not near as popular as the as the shorter trips. It used to be that the, the mm. Epsom Derby winner uh, one time, his, his objective the following year was the Ascot Gold Cup. But that wouldn't happen now because... Not of, commercially of, viable. Not, com not commercially viable. And, uh, you know, people like uh, to have stallions at stud that are, that are speed horses, really, like, you know, because uh, you'll get quicker results. You generally get quicker results. People are not as inclined to wait two or three years. And I can see what you're saying there about Apple's Jade. By the time she has a foal and by the time it, it, it is old enough to race, possibly over jumps, you're looking, could be looking four, five, six years down the line, you know. And uh, it's probably, again, not commercially viable uh, compared to, the, the, the way it is now but look as I say it seemed the emphasis seems to be on getting quick results nowadays you know it's, it, it has changed that way the, la the last horse I was involved in was Sabras and uh, maybe not the last horse one the last and um, I I got him out of a claimer in Sligo and yeah. so he 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 finished third I think in the claimer third or fourth um, you claim him you basically have him the following day um, yeah. He ran for a year. He he was in the money, I think, 10 or 11 times. The final start in my colours was in a claimer in Sligo. If not the very same race I claimed about 12 months on, he won that race. So I got the prize money and the claim, which was it was nominal. It was about four or five grand. And then yeah. the new owner entered him in Ballon Robe on the Monday or the Tuesday afterwards, and he won. So it was right. like, there was, do, you know, do you know the way it's like, Apple's Jade yeah. is like six or seven years. Sabras was like six or seven hours. Do you know what I mean? He was, yeah. he had the money, you paid it, and there's your horse, he's ready to run next week. And it's, it's, it's mad the kind of variety of things that can, that can be offered uh, to you as an owner in racing. Oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's true. But I think, like, generally, when, I'm sure when you bought that horse, you were hoping for a quick result as well. Like, I mean, you were starting out with a horse there who was fit, who was who had run in races, uh, who was ready to go straight away. So you had the expense of, we'll say, if you bought a yearling uh, in October and it was the following 
March, April, May before they got to see a racetrack and you've had to pay all the fees up, up to that point. You've paid for the horse. And then if he runs a few bad races and the, and the entry fees are adding up and he's getting nowhere, um, and they, they, you know, I always say it costs the same um, to keep uh, an 80 horse as it does to keep honeysuckle. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's, it's it, it costs the same. Mm-hmm. So if you're not getting results fairly quickly now, um, you're not going to hang around, I'd say, too long, you know. A couple of texts in, uh, Patrick says, are there any notable howlers that Sandy looks back on with his hands over his eyes? Um, you don't have to tell us. You don't have to, but if, yeah, you, if yeah, you want I, to. Um, I I actually can't think of one now that I would call a Is howler. Is this your football um, career now or your handicapping? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. All right, we we'll have to yeah. get to that as well. Sandy was a very proficient uh, footballer for Newbridge Town. Scored against Shamrock Rovers. Oh no, I'm I'm starting to go all red here now, John. <laughs> Take it easy there. Take... <laughs> but uh, no, I can't remember. And actually, you know, sometimes a horse would win ten lengths in a handicap, and you might have said to yourself that, you know, God, when I look at it now, I probably underestimated him or something like that. You know, but you just take it on the chin and, and you'll obviously penalise the horse for the fact he won so easily. But I don't... Uh, I, I hate saying it because it sounds like I'm perfect or something like no, that, which it, I'm not. It, it, but it sounds like um, the way you've described it is that it's this constantly evolving and rapidly shifting uh, massive algorithm that you guys have to have in your heads. Do you write all this stuff down? Is there is there written records of like... Do you have massive Excel sheets? What what do you actually use to keep track of everything? Uh, we use a program generally called Race for Me, uh, Race on Interactive, and it's um, uh, now we have our da- our official database with all the horses obviously on our system and so forth and etc. Uh, and we have form books, but everything is really online now. And we use a, a program called Race from Interactive, which is which is run by the Racing Post. Right. And it's a, it's a it's a system. It just gives us easy access. We can cross reference. Uh, horses have these horses met before but just with a click of a finger then you can find out what they've met before how did they perform against one another before um uh, and you can immediately see you know the different distances they ran over uh, you can look back and see you know maybe it was running over too short a trip too long a trip there's 101 things you can you can look uh, well, you can look at on I, this i was actually going to ask that um what what are the key things that you look for because obviously uh, you know as different pointers have different ideas when it comes to i'm going to back this jockey i'm going to back this trainer i'm going to back horses who like a particular type of ground i'm going to back horses mm. on a tuesday uh, i know somebody who yeah. who, who who took yeah, yeah, um yeah times and and was obsessed with the the times and and said that that worked for him what what do you do to to say i think this horse is going to um be off this rating what what are the kind of key data points that you look for yeah we use everything really Jerry. like i mean yes we use ground we use distance uh, uh obviously um we look at point if the horse is running point to points or if the horse has come off the flat now we don't use um we don't use it literally, so to speak, in that a horse might come off the flat rated 50, which would be very moderate. So he comes hurdling and he runs three very moderate races before he gets his handicap mark. Uh, so it appears from his flat form as well that this horse is, is just moderate. He's just not much good. So we're usually happy enough with them. It's more if you have a horse that's a very high rating on the flat and he runs in three hurdle races and his hurdle performances are nowhere near um the level of his performances on the flat. And that's just to give us an idea of their level of ability. Uh, because there's an awful lot of horses who are would be rated highly on, uh, on the flat, but just don't take the jumping hurdles. They mm. just don't. It's a different discipline and yeah. they just don't take to it. So th- th- there's a whole lot of process that goes on in your head, really, as I say, from point to point, to flat racing, to ground, to the distance they maybe run on in the flat compared to the distance they're running on over hurdles. You might see a horse who only ever ran over a mile on the flat going hurdling and the minimum distance is two miles and you're saying, look, he probably doesn't stay. Mm. And certainly if he's running on heavy ground, he's, you know, you certainly would, wouldn't expect that he'll, that, that, that he'll stay. That's the other Which thing. All the, well, mm. sorry, just on that point, right? So you, you have to give the horse a mark irrespective of what they're running in and like it's very difficult because you you give a horse a mark he's run three times on bottomless ground and then all of a sudden summer comes the ground is great he romps home and you're like well it turns out this is a, a good horse yeah. is a, a yeah. horse that like good ground 
yeah, yeah, that can happen. Generally speaking, if we have a horse exactly like the one you said, it has run three times. Uh, we don't have to ha- we don't have to handicap a horse after three runs. That's one of the bits of discretion that we have. If we look at this horse and we have a, an inkling that is maybe better, that we'd like to see it on better ground, or a different trip or whatever, um, we probably won't handicap that horse. And okay. We'll make it run a fourth time. We'll make it run a fourth time and look at it again. Now, eventually. Um, uh, it, we'd have to give it a mark like you know and we have to accept look maybe it's just not much good we don't know we're all the time reading between the lines we never see these horses working uh, on the gallops or we never see them working up the curl or anything like that so we're reading between the lines all the time and in when you don't handicap a horse after three runs you will often get a trainer will ring you and say why didn't you handicap my horse and you have a conversation with them discuss the horse say what you think and he'll say what he thinks and if you're happy enough or I find the way I do it and if I'm happy enough the way he's putting his case forward I'll say okay I might say I'll give it a handicap mark or maybe run it once more we'll see but the advantage as I would call it is the onus becomes on the trainer then if he tells you I tell you this horse is no good and you give him a relatively low mark and the horse comes out and wins then it's like the boy that cried wolf yeah. mm. you know his next horse comes in he's going to have more one, more than one horse in training if he's going to make a career out of it yeah. so he comes back to you the next time and he's on a very sticky wicket then because you're not inclined to listen to what he has to say and over the years you develop um, uh, a relationship as such with trainers who you know you can trust you know and yeah. if, if they tell you straight look that horse is way too high or whatever I'm inclined to take it on board and it's it's usually the case. It is usually the case. As I say, we're not always right. Yeah, and fair enough. I, 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 I encourage the younger trainers coming along in, in particular to, to talk to us about their horses, that they're training them. And we're there to facilitate them to a certain extent, but we just want to have a level playing field and any information they can give us about their horse, uh, we will take on board and then decide what we're, what we're going to do. Yeah. But obviously, as I say, if they if they pull a fast one as such, um, it's the only gamble that, that, they'll, that they'll ever land, you know, as far as I'd be concerned. Yeah. No, fair enough. And sorry, just to, to labour the point on the on the data again, because I like it's yeah. it's you. It's not just the trainers who are sometimes taking on. It's obviously the, the punters as well. There's no single individual data point. Like you take splits and all that kind of stuff into consideration, but it, it's the full picture that you've built up over the years of watching this horse, the the um, predecessors of this horse, this trainer, uh, horses on this track. That's what all goes into it. Yeah, it's times would come into it more on the flat. Because, right. you know, there's it, it's a lot more straightforward on the flat, I would have said, in that there's no obstacles in the way, for starters, like, you know. And uh, there's um, they they kind of have pretty standard times. In jump racing, uh, a race, a hurdle race, they could jump off. You could have two divisions of a handicap hurdle, we'll say. First one is run kind of 20 seconds faster than the other. Now, I would take certainly take that on board, that one is run, run faster than the other. And you'd say, well, look, um, they obviously went very slow in this particular race and then it was a bit of a sprint, whereas the other race was run from end to end. So you would take note of that. Uh, everything that becomes, you know, like, I mean, uh, a slow pace mightn't have suited one horse, uh, so you have to take that on board. There's a whole lot of little things. Um, obviously, as I said, the obvious ones are the ground, the trip, the ride, the horse got, how he jumped. And that's the difference between the flat, obviously. You have to make decisions about would horse A have beaten horse B if he hadn't made a mistake at the yeah. second last or yeah. if he hadn't fallen at the last or whatever. So you've, you got to watch, you've got to watch a race 15 times if there's 15 horses in it, essentially. Uh, I wouldn't say I'd watch it 15 times now, to be honest with you, but usually... Close enough. You just get, you'd, yeah, you'd watch it a fair few times. You would go back over and over it, but you would... And I have to say, like, that say now we have 25 runners in a race at Navan, as we probably will have tomorrow. Um, as I say, I'm not going to see every horse in every race and exactly how they ran. I actually break it down. I actually break it down and there's particular horses I will watch. Um, like the horse that's having his third run over hurdles, this is going to be his qualifying run. So you would take a particular notice of him. 
Um, the horses that have handicap marks, they're straightforward enough. You can keep an eye on them and hopefully they're the ones that are going to help you evaluate the whole form of the race. But horses that are having their first ever run over uh, over hurdles or fences, to me, I'm not saying we give them a free pass, but look, every horse having its first run will need the experience and will come on, will take more of an interest the second time and an even closer interest on its third start. And uh, yeah, you don't see everything. You watch replays um, and numerous times, certainly all, all right, but you wouldn't necessarily have to watch every horse in every race um, to watch it 15 or 20 times you know and then look over time I'm doing the job so long now you get your own way of doing things you know it's it's a you just have your own way and then we have uh, what we call the steward secretaries uh, and the stewards who monitor the races and um, they might come and say to me that horse there was quiet enough or whatever, like, you know, and we, we, we take notes off one another okay. and keep an eye on them the next time. Or maybe if a steward or a steward secretary mentioned the horse to me, when I go back home and that and review the race, I just take a particular notice of it just to see. They're like uh, your umpires calling you in to hear Yeah, them. no, no. Keep they're, mind they're, that corner forward there. Yeah, they're they're a great help to us as well. And it's not just a one-man team, you know. But before, before you go as well, just the... I'm sure you you uh, were your interest was uh, piqued by the recent um, British official response to Cheltenham, which to me now is kind of the equivalent of repainting the house that's built in a swamp. Like um, because I think the problems in British racing are nothing to do with their handicap system. To my mind, no, that's just my view. I think um, British racing is in, if not an existential crisis, is is in for um, a very, you know. Um, interesting year 10 20 years ahead but what did you make of this they've they've reacted to the fact that irish horse has obviously absolutely obliterated the british horse in cheltenham um which was a massacre really considering irish horses really should only be winning give or take fifth to a third of the races over there um what did you make of their tweak into the system that uh, followed cheltenham um i always admire the bha the way they they do these things. They do try to look at everything to see if there's a reason why this is happening. In my mind, um, it's simply because we have the best horses. That exactly. is the, like I mean, we have the best horses, and that's it. Like as I often said, if you put Pep Guardiola in charge of Rochdale, they're not going to win the Champions League because Pep Guardiola has gone there. He needs the players. And the top four in the Premier League. I was reading in the Racing Post actually there this morning that the the top. Uh, the, the winner of the of the Premier League will, comes from the top four, generally speak, the top four with the biggest salaries. You know, so the big money buys the best players. The big money buys the best horses. So if you have the best horses, you're going to win the big races. And I know people have said to us that, you know, well, that's all very fine if you have the best horses, but um, handicap should be a more level playing field. But they kind of go hand in hand in my book to a certain extent because back in the late 80s there when when, when we were on the floor as, as regards winners at Cheltenham like uh, we hadn't times were bad and every horse that won a decent race in Ireland a bumper or a hurdle was on the boat to England the following week and they had all the best horses but interestingly around that time um, 87, 88, 89 we had one winner in 87, one winner in 88. We had no winners in 89 and we two winners in 1990. And at the same period in those 80s, we only had four handicap hurdle win or four handicap winners in that whole decade. Wow. We'd only four handicap winners in that decade. I think it kind of goes hand in hand. And the country was we, in bits at the time. The country was in bits at the time. They haven't got the owners that we have now. And, and, and thanks to the government backing and everything that we have, we have better prize money. And the better prize money, we have the likes of Kenny Alexander, who owns Honeysuckle uh, over here. We have Chievely Park Stud, who have Envoy Allen, Sir Gerhard, Colixias. And they're all in training in Ireland. You know, that, that's, where, that's where the money is at the moment. So we have the best horses. We're buying up the best horses. And the best horses win the best races, just like the best players will win you a Champions League you know so it is um, look they looked at their at their handicap system and one of the things I would say about the handicap system and it's, it's not the handicappers it's 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 the actual system because I've, I have pointed out to them at our Anglo-Irish classification that uh, field sizes have a huge difference in the way this whole thing uh, works in that you could have three races in England on a Saturday um, and their, their f average field size is 7.2 or something like that. So they'd have eight runners in each race. We have an equivalent race in Ireland 
and we can accommodate maybe 25 horses in the one race. And they have three races over there in three different parts of the country over the same trip and all of that, but they've only eight runners in each race. So over there, maybe the winner of each race will go up seven pounds. The second will say it might go up two or three pounds. The third might go up a pound. So in effect, they are putting up nine horses in their in their rating system. In Ireland, they all run in the same race. Mm. And while they all run in the same race, um, we're only going to be putting up the first three probably. So we'll only be putting up three horses. They'll be putting up nine horses. And what's more, if we have 24 or five runners in a race, we'll probably drop 10 or 12 of those. Whereas they'll only drop one or two. You know, so you can see, in my opinion, how they're ratings climb not because of the handicapper but it's the handicapping system the fact you can run three races um in three different parts of the country over there and generally of course we only have one meeting at the same time here Mm. but we can accommodate all our horses in the one race so it's it's that's just the way it is you know that's just the way it is they have too much racing uh they're very f- uh, small field sizes and also 67 percent or something like that of their um uh sorry 81 percent of their chases over there for example are handicaps and only 43 of ours are handicaps and over there as well in britain 57 percent of their hurdle races are handicaps and only 40 percent of our hurdles or handicaps, which that means that the trainers are running horses in an awful lot of races and they've nowhere to run but handicaps. So their ratings, when they win or whatever, they keep climbing, they, they keep climbing. But I was looking at um, an example there uh, of a winner we had of the handicap, uh, Gallop and Deschamps, who went on to be um, a grade one winner that Willie Mullins had. And he won the, um, it was the Martin Pipe, it was that he, that he won. And we were first third and fifth and the British were second, fourth and sixth. So between us we had three each in the first six places well divided up. And when I looked at it the three Irish horses had only ever run in four handicaps in their career. Gallop in the Champ, the winner, was having his first handicap start. The British horses had run between them the second, fourth and sixth, had run between them in 21 handicaps. So they were hugely exposed they'd reached their limit and, you know, they couldn't go any further. Whereas our horses were really uh, unexposed, particularly the winner who had who had never run in a handicap before. And uh, I think, you know, that's the problem with their system. They have too many handicaps over there. You can pick and choose a bit more here in mm. Ireland. But the Irish trainers, you know, they, they do the job so well. They target these races from the start of the season. They might have a run in a handicap before they go. They might not. But whatever way they go, they will go over there unexposed with a few pounds to spare. Whereas the British horses seem to be handicapped up to the hilt by then because they run in nothing but handicaps yeah. all season, you know? Yeah, the so, best explanation for that I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. There, like, there are lot, lots of issues in terms of the depth of the respective sports, um, but that's... That's staggering, really. You know, four handicaps from three and then 20-odd for the other three. So there you go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, once you run in a handicap, you're, you know, you're exposing yourself, yeah. really, like, you know. Yeah. And and then you reach a level and then you you kind of pan out, mm. you know, and that, that's it. But as I say, our, our, our guys are just doing the right thing. They go over there with a bit up their sleeve, so to speak, even if they have run in handicaps and that, mm. you know, they might run for a bit of experience, but they're very unexposed you know, you, you're only going to expect them to improve, really. Like, so mm. I just think before they go, they have a few pounds in hand, maybe before they even start. You know, and th- that's what I think makes. I think that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. Yeah. Is is this your favourite time of the year, Sandy? Where absolutely everything is possible. The season is just getting started. You've done all your work over the summer. You made sure everything is ready to go. And from this point forward, all the information is changing minute by minute, really. It is all the time, yeah. And I oh, know I love this time of the year. It is, as I said, the unofficial start of the national hunt season, kind of when you get to Listowel, even though it officially starts in May. And you do have the Galway Plate and the Galway Hurdle there as well, two very good races um, during the summer. But it's just, this is where the, the, the kind of the, the Cheltenham horses and the entry horses and those start to appear. And it's always a pretty exciting time. Plus all the new novices coming out as well, you know. So yeah, it's pretty pretty ex- uh, exciting time. It'll build up to Christmas, which is great. Then we all take a, a breather until the Leperstown uh, Festival comes along and then on to Cheltenham. And for me, it makes the year fly, to be honest with you, uh, the way it works, you know. There's always something to be looking forward to. Uh, Andy, brilliant, sadly, brilliant spending time in your company again. And I definitely always feel like we're a little bit smarter, even if all the information doesn't <laughs> always get retained, because yeah, there's a lot of sure. it. 
but uh, yeah, yeah. it's an incredible job you do and thanks very much for sharing that with us today thanks Andy not at all guys see you then Andrew Sandy Shaw there the, uh, the handicapper who's responsible for essentially trying to make all the races finish in a dead heat yeah very see. difficult job very difficult job um, you know whenever there's a dog race and they finish up under with a blanket over them they, you know they say hats, hats off to the grader and uh, that is if they say the referee's best outcome is when nobody talks about him which is a little bit simplistic but I think that's kind of still vaguely true the handicapper's best job is when they all finish basically in a line yeah and that's that's when he has his like his his uh, his moment of of um uh, kind of proper, proper, uh, I've done my job here. Friday Night Racing is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. That's um, two quick things to tell you about. I want to tell you about a cycle that is taking place. Uh, the Coast to Curra charity cycle in memory of Pat Smullen goes to post next Saturday. That's the 25th of uh, September. This is the type of thing right up your street. I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm taking part. Are you? I am. Um, but I, I think what with you know, I think I will have to come back here for work at three o'clock. So, um, but I'll I'll take part as in, as much as I can prior to that. And it starts it starts pretty early. It's like seven o'clock at Laytown in the morning. Finishes at the Curra. The cycle is one hundred and fifty five k in total. That took you six hours to one hundred and thirty five k during the week. That was a lot, according to your Strava. Uh, B- Bera, yeah. Um, there was a lot of climbing in it. Um, it sounded the, like there was pints in the middle. No. Um, no, no, I would, would n- definitely not advise points in the middle of a cycle for for various reasons. But um, Bear Peninsula, yeah, 160k, but a lot of climb in the Healy Pass twice. Right. Um, so yeah, it's tiring. That's not the six hours doesn't account for the stoppages in between for coffees and so on. Either. Well, that's what I was saying. Uh, starting at Laytown, finishes at the Curra. The cycle is 155k in total, and all the money is uh, going to be donated to Cancer Trials Ireland. Check out coastacurra at gmail.com for a sponsorship card. And there's a Coast Curra GoFundMe page Great as well. Great cause, yeah. And I was talking to Gavin Lynch, uh, the organiser. Obviously, this is um, in response to uh, Pat, Pat Smullen's death. And um, Gavin's own uh, mother passed away from pancreatic cancer as well. So it's uh, primarily for that. And uh, Pat's anniversary, obviously, was last weekend. Um, so it's a great cause. And um, yeah, taking in some great racing uh, landmarks on the way. Um, it says here the battle for the minor places and the tote tend to follow has taken a turn Johnny has overtaken me to grab second place mostly thanks to his Irish champion stakes winner St Mark's Basilica which he did try to have removed from his stable by the way yeah but he got injured 13 points separate second and third places so it's not over just yet Uh, Tote would like to let customers know that the Tote jackpot is back to play the jackpot you pick the winners in races 3 to 6 and you can play the jackpot at any Irish race meeting and on Tote Dot IE. That's Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit HRI.ie. Anything about this weekend's race you want to talk about? Um, list all starts Sunday and um, obviously Navin tomorrow and Gorn. Very good listed race at Gorn. Um, and yeah, Navin, return of Gordon Elliott um, and Davy Russell. Davy Russell is back today. I have to say, I really really doubt of this um, as much as I put on a bit of a facade in, in talking to him and I didn't I didn't I did not think David Russell was coming back he's a remarkable man possibly a bit mad but definitely remarkable alright we love to see it we wish him all the very best as well we'll see you next Friday take care Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland love every racing moment visit hri.ie